Hello and welcome to the first of hopefully many super simple flash game tutorials. Now as the title suggests I'm going to try and keep this very basic. It's, it's quite difficult to keep it basic because the game's got some um, stuff in it that's slightly beyond beginner level but I will talk my way through it and um, try and simplify it whenever possible. We're working in flash. If you don't have flash go and get a free trial. You can have it for 30 days from Adobe and that should be more than enough time to do a few tutorials make up your mind about whether it's something you, you feel like you want to pursue. When you do have it, you load it up, you're presented with this screen and in just a second we're going to make a new ActionScript 3 file. Just before that let's have a look at what we're actually making. So we've got the prototype here and it's um, based on Simon which was an electronic game when I was a kid. Basically you remember the pattern and repeat it back. So the computer randomly generates a pattern, you memorize it and you play it back. <laughs> it does pick all the buttons, it's just obviously um, liking yellow and blue at the moment. But if we get one wrong we can see that, oh no, we lost. So we've got game over and it's going to start again instantly. There we go. So that's the sort of thing we're aiming for. We're going to put in about an hour to uh, to get it to that stage. Let's make our ActionScript 3 file. So we're here in Flash. Quickly set up our stage. So in the Properties window, wherever yours may be, it could be at the bottom. Let's change the size to uh, let's say 600 by 600. You can change the stage color if you like. We will eventually draw over the top of it. So. It's not massively important, but go for it. Okay, and we're up and running. Let's just save it at this point. File save, and I'll drop it into this folder. I'll overwrite the old one. Okay, so before we can start any code, we actually need something we can work with. So whether or not these are the full buttons, the final buttons, remains to be seen, but we do need some kind of graphical representation of our button. So let's find our oval tool in the toolbar. It's hidden beneath the rectangle tool, or you can just hit O on your keyboard. With that selected, you might want to pick a colour. Mine happens to be red at the moment, which is fine because red's one of the colours in the game. Click and drag, and if you hold shift, you will um, guarantee that you get a perfect circle. So let's uh, say about that sort of size, let go. When you're happy with it, go to your selection tool or press V. Double click on your object so you get all of the outline as well. And we're going to convert that to a symbol. So you can right click, convert to symbol, or you can modify, convert to symbol. Let's give it a name. We'll call this red button. And the type will be movie clip. Registration will be in the center. And we're sticking with movie clip because it's going to animate and so on. Button, you could adapt this to work with buttons if you like. Graphics won't work because we need some code in there and so on and they don't support that. So we're going to go with movie clip and I'm going to hit OK. That now gives us this, this button we can work with. Um, for the sake of getting started we could just leave it at that. Maybe have four red buttons. Um, but I just want to add in a quick visual representation for when they're clicked on or when they're selected. So we could edit that in place by double clicking on it. Or you can go to your library. Um, if you can't see your library, go Window Library. And you can double click the icon to edit it in its own window. And let's do that. So let's edit it. And just so we can tell when it's been clicked on, I'm going to add another keyframe down the timeline here. So um, select the second keyframe. I'm going to hit F6 to insert a new keyframe and I'm going to recolor it so I'm going to make it white when we click on it. So it will go white when we click on it and I want that to last for a few frames so I'm going to go to frame 10 just right click and insert a normal frame so that the white there lasts for 9 frames before coming back to the red. Okay. If we test our game at this point, so control test movie test can see that it continuously does it, which isn't ideal. So we're going to stop that now with a little bit of code. Our first bit of code, and it's a whopper. Are you ready for this? We're going to click on the first keyframe, 
going to right click and go to actions and we're going to type the really complicated word stop. So we're going to stop the animation. And stop is a function of our movie clip and functions have brackets after them because they sometimes need extra bits of information and the extra bits of information would go in there. Stop luckily doesn't need any extra information, we can just leave it as it is, close that box and then test the, the game again, test movie and you can see that it stops on the first keyframe now so we're okay and we will eventually tell it to play when we click on it. That could actually be our first port of call, we could um, just do it so that when we click on the button it uh, plays that little animation for us. So we'll look at doing that in the second section. I'm going to break it up as much as possible. So now we're set up, we're good to go. Just going to click back to scene one and um, just pause it, give myself a breather before we go on. Okay, we're going to look at getting the buttons working, look at working with handling these buttons. I know we've only drawn one, but we can we can replace them later on. As long as we've got something to click on, we're okay. To get set up then, we're just going to go to the library and we can drag out an extra copy of our button, um, an extra three copies, or you can hold the Alt key and drag directly from the symbol to make a clone of it. So we're going to get four buttons on stage there and we're going to name them before we start with the coding. So just select them one at a time, go to your properties menu, properties window and give them an instance name. This first one I'll call red, second one blue, this one can be green, green, green and yellow. So we've got four buttons, four different names and we're going to do some code now. Now the code I do will go on the timeline in the interest of keeping it as simple as possible and keeping it within a, a suitable time frame. If you're looking to be a programmer eventually you want to quickly get yourself away from the timeline and learn classes because they're very important um, for a wealth of reasons I'm not going to go into. But I find that newcomers take much easier to the timeline. It seems to make more sense to have things laid out in time format rather than in separate files. So we're going to make a new layer, we're going to rename it, call it code, right click and go to the actions. Okay, so we're working on the main timelines code and we can now use the button names that we've made. don't know why this has grown, let's shrink that back. We can use red, blue, green and yellow to access our buttons. And the first port of call is to make them all expect a click. So we're going to tell our buttons to expect clicks, clicks from the mouse. If you're unfamiliar with that line I've just done, that's a comment. That's Two forward slashes means you can write something however you like and it won't break your code. So that isn't actual code, that's just a, an explanation of what's to come. We're going to add event listeners to all of our buttons by typing their names. So we'll type red dot and we use the add event listener function which lets us tell that movie clip to listen out for something happening. In the brackets at the end we explain what we're listening for. In this case we're listening for listening for a mouse event dot click. Make sure you use the same capitalization as me. It should go blue if you've typed it correctly. And then we have a comma and we explain or well, we tell Flash what we want it to do when this button does receive a click. And I'm going to make a function called clicked. Close the brackets and you should finish your line with a semicolon. It will work without that but get in the habit of doing them. Let's just get the red button working first before we come back and uh, worry about the others. So I'm going to drop down a few lines. We need to explain to Flash what clicked means. If I test my file at this point, so we can go control test movie or you can just do command enter or control enter, we get an error because Flash doesn't know what clicked means. So there's nothing wrong with the name we've used, we're allowed to use clicked, you've just got to make sure to explain what that actually means. That could be called Bob, Jim, it could be called anything. Just make sure that you do explain what those words mean when you make them. To do that we use the keyword function, so we're making a function of our own and it's called clicked. Functions are followed by brackets which we'll come back to in a second and then to actually define what a function does you use curly brackets like this. 
So want to open, then you've got the body of your function, and then you close your function at the bottom. At the moment, this isn't quite right because our clicked function, because the, because this click, clicked function is in response to an event listener, it takes in a bit of information. So when when you click your mouse on a flash game, flash generates a little bit of information about that click and it passes it to any functions that were listening out for a click. So we need to expect that in here. We could give that another name, we could call that Steve, I don't know, just for the sake of having a name, but get in the habit of using names that make sense or follow convention. In this case, I'm actually going to call it click info. So it's got a name that kind of makes sense. We know that this object relates to information about the click that just happened. We can also tell Flash what type of information this is. If we use a colon after the name and put a mouse event, because the type of information that comes in is a mouse event, it's in response to a mouse event, Flash makes a mouse event, passes it in, and we're good to go. We can use that in our code later on. Just for the sake of seeing if it's working, we're going to trace a message. This will just put a message out in our little text box up at the top here. So it's going to trace hello, hello, and give it a go. So command and enter. Click our red button and we get hello. Notice that the other buttons don't work. That's because they're not actively listening for clicks just yet. So we can remedy that by copying the red line pasting it three times <coughs> and updating the buttons that they're added to. So we've got red, green, uh, red, blue, green and yellow. Try it now and it should say hello when you click on each one. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so far so good, um, but quite slow progress so far, so we'll step it up a notch now. What we want to do is check that the, the button we clicked on is the next one in the pattern, which means we actually need to make the pattern. And I'm going to do this up at the top here. So right at the top, we'll have variable <coughs> variables, I'm losing my voice, relating to score, pattern, and so on. So anything to do with the score or the list, things like that, we're going to make up at the top here. So we're going to make a variable which means keyword is var. Variable is just a piece of memory we can use for our own purposes. And I'm going to call this pattern. So this will be the pattern that we're trying to replicate or that we've got to remember to play in the game. And this is going to be a list. So it's going to be a list of buttons to click in order. So I'm going to put equals new array. An array is a list. There are various different types of lists, but we're going to use an array. And we're going to populate it as well. So underneath, we'll populate it. We'll do pattern dot push. So we use the keyword push to put elements into an array. And we're going to just make up a little pattern now. I know that, that in the final game it will be randomly generated, but at the moment we're just going to pass some in. We'll do red, blue, red, yellow. So that's the pattern we're after. We, can, we could compress these two lines down into one. That could just read as var pattern equals, and we can use uh, square brackets as shorthand. I could just say that. That would do that all in one line, just so you know. If we're going to check where we are in the list, we also need to remember the current position that we're at. So let's make a variable for our current position in the list, and that will start at zero. And that's because flash counts from zero. So in your list here, instead of going one, two, three, four, flash will go zero, one, two, three. So we're going to start the position at zero. Back to our clicked function, we can now make use of our pattern and of the position, and we're going to make use of our clicked info to see which button was clicked on. We need to check that the clicked button was the right button. So we're going to ask a question here with keyword if, and then in brackets we're going to say if click info, so we're asking for information from the actual click, dot target. So we're asking if the target of the click equals, but we need two equals because we're asking the question. 
If you use one equals, like here, it sets it. We use two because we're asking a question. So if click info dot target equals, and then we go pattern, and in square brackets we put position to access the right part of the pattern. Close our normal brackets, and we open another set of curly brackets to deal with that that if. So everything inside this if will happen if this was true. If this is right, then this if will happen. And we'll just trace out right. And let's give that a go. So the pattern was red, blue, red, yellow, wasn't it? So let's go red, and it says right. Let's go blue, and it does nothing. That's because we haven't changed the position in our list. So when we do get something right, we need to increase the position. So we'll do position equals position plus one. So we're moving one up the list. Let's just comment that in. Increase the position in the pattern. Give that a go. So now we should be able to go red, blue, and we get right twice, back to red, and then yellow, wasn't it? So we're right four times. If we click again, nothing happens because there is no more pattern. There are times when that would cause an error. It's not at the moment just because our code isn't as efficient as it could be. What we also want to do is make a note of when we're wrong because it's game over if you click on the wrong button. So at the bottom of the if, we're going to put else. And this is where you're wrong. So let's trace wrong. Give that a go. Red is right, blue is right, but if I go down to green now and click, we get wrong. So, so far so good, I'd say there. We um, still have quite a lot to go in terms of making the pattern generate, but, but I'm going to keep splitting it up. So for the sake of this section, our buttons are working, we can click on them. Oh, actually, we'll make them play as well, just before we finish this section. Play the button. When, when you get it right, let's play animation. Spent the time making it, we might as well use it. So let's do click info.target and we can do dot play which will tell it to play if it's stopped or what might be better just in case we we get to the point where our game is running so quickly that the button animation doesn't have time to fully play before it's up again. We should tell it, force it to go to and play from frame 2. So frame 2 is where our um, white animation starts. So we'll actually force it to go to and play frame 2. Let's give that a go. I'm just going to save it as well. Now when I click, if I get it right, it goes white. OK, OK, OK. And if I get it wrong, it doesn't. I think that's a decent point to leave this part of the video at. Uh, and we'll, we'll move on to generating the pattern in the next one, which is a bit more complicated. So the time's come to randomly generate our pattern. It's also going to require us to make the distinction between it being the player's go and the computer's turn, so it's probably a good idea to sort that to begin with. So we'll, we'll, we'll make another variable up near the top. Let's make a variable that remembers if it's the player's turn or not. So we'll have our player's turn, and by default that will be false. So when the game starts it won't be the player's turn, it'll be the computer's turn. And we can um, we can use that in our clicked function so you, you can't take your go unless it's, it's, um, it's your turn. So in our clicked function let's just quickly add in something that accounts for that. So in there we can have an if right at the top. Before we do anything, we'll have an if, and we'll say if player's turn equals equals false, return. Very simple line there that just says, if it's not the player's turn, stop this function. That's what return does. Return just gets you out of the function. We could also replace this. That doesn't have to be written that way. That could be put as if not player's turn. So the exclamation mark there means the opposite, or false, or not. It means not, effectively. So if it's not the player's turn, return. 
Let's see if that works. So we shouldn't be able to take a go now. Yeah, we don't get any traces, we don't get any animation because it's not our turn. If we set it to true, so it is the player's turn, we can click on stuff. Put that back to false and we're going to start letting the computer generate the pattern, which means we don't need to um, hard code one in at the start, so we can delete that line. What we'll do after all the variables, we'll um, start generating the pattern. We're going to do this using a timer, as you might remember from the prototype, the, um, the pattern doesn't generate instantly, it generates over time, and we're going to use timers to do this. There are very complicated ways of using timers, more elaborate ways than we're going to use. We're just going to use a nice handy little function called set timeout that Flash has. And that, sorry, I think I'm going down with a cold. <clears throat> that lets Flash handle all the complicated stuff behind doing the timing. You just get to reap the benefits of it. Um, and that's a function, so let's open the brackets. Set timeout, it wants a function name that you're going to use after a certain amount of time and it wants to know how long to wait. So we'll make a function called next move, and then separated by commas, we'll put the amount of time to wait until using that function, which will be a second, or a thousand milliseconds as it works in. So we'll just comment what that means. Call next move after one second, which means we need to explain what next move is. And just for the sake of needing a few things up, I'm going to hide some code. So I'm going to select my event listeners, collapse them. Fairly happy with the clicked function for now, so I'm going to collapse that. And at the bottom, I'm going to make the next move function. So we'll have function, next move. This time we don't need any additional information. Nothing gets passed into next move, so we can leave the brackets empty. And then we can start our function. The trick in here is to pick a random button and add it to the pattern. And there are various ways of, different, of um, increasing difficulty to do it. We'll start with a really basic but quite clumsy, cumbersome and not very reusable way of doing it. We'll just randomly generate a number and then we'll have loads of ifs that let's pick the right button. So we'll start by generating a number. Generate a random number. We'll store that in a variable called random number. We'll make it equal. Math.random. Math.random gives you a random number between 0 and 1. So if we want to get a random number between, say, 1 and 4, we need to times that by 4 and then round it up because we don't want zeros. We don't want to be stuck on, say, uh, well, we don't have five buttons, so we can't go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we need 1, 2, 3, or 4. And to round it up, we can do math.seal, which is ceiling, get the ceiling of this number, I guess. I'm guessing that's where it comes from, that's what I, I've always believed. And that will take the number in the brackets here, which is a random number between 0 and 4, and it will round it up to the nearest full number, so we should be left with random number between 1 and 4. Generate a random number between 1 and 4. And then we can have a series of ifs to map that number to a button. So let's say if random number equals equals 1. Red button next. We'll comment this in. And we can copy that if. So this is why it gets quite clunky. We're reusing, recoding stuff. We don't really need to. So We'll do it this way just to get it working and then I'll, I'll do it in a slightly better way and as a, a way that lets us add more buttons or take buttons out later on. So if the random number is 1 it's going to be red, 2 will be blue, 3 can be green, 4 can be yellow. And that means that in these ifs then we need to add the right button to our pattern and we can just do pattern dot push and then in each bit we put the right one so red for that one copy it you can see it's getting very long very pasty you should try and get rid of copying and pasting as much as possible that's kind of why functions exist so you can reuse stuff 
shouldn't need to do this like I am at the moment, but I suppose it helps to see doing it in different ways. And that will add them to the list. Let's um, see if that works. So at the end of that, we'll trace the pattern out. So trace pattern. Save it and give it a go. So after a second, it should, there we go, it's traced out the pattern. It's not giving us the names of the buttons, so it will always say red button, I think. But if we also tell it to call itself again, so after the this set timeout has happened, let's copy it. After it's traced the pattern, let's do the timer again. And we get stuck in a little loop here where every second we're generating a new button into the pattern. So let's try it. So there we've got one button, after another second, two, three, four, and it'll keep going because we've not we've not told it to stop. But you can definitely see that the pattern's getting bigger, which is good. We should also tell them to play, which adds an extra level of copy and paste into this. So we should play the button that's that's been picked. Uh, let's see. We'll do red dot play there, or we'll go to and play two. We're going to be getting rid of of this in a sec when we neaten it up. Do it the clunky way so we appreciate the uh, the faster way later on. So let's play the buttons as they're added. We can see which ones have been added. Red was added, yellow was added, blue was added, yellow, 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 red, yellow. Okay so it's working, it's picking random ones, That's that's working pretty well. At the end of the day, the player never really sees the code, so it's it's not the end of the world if your code's a bit messy, but to save yourself a bit of heartache and frustration, we'll, we'll, we'll neaten it up. So instead of doing it this long-winded way, I'm going to get rid of that. We'll still use the random number, but instead of having all those ifs, right at the top we're going to put all of our buttons into a list. So we're going to have two lists, effectively. We'll have a list of the pattern, and a list of buttons that could possibly go into the pattern. So let's make another list underneath there, and we'll call that buttons equals new array. Directly underneath, let's put all our buttons into that array. So buttons.push, red, blue, yellow, green. So we now have a list of all of our buttons. And instead of having ifs for every button, we can just randomly pick one button from that list to use. We've already generated our random number. It's actually too high now. We need to round that down. So instead of math.seal, we're going to use math.floor. So ceiling and floor makes sense. Rounding the number down. So we should get a number between 0 and 3, which is, as I mentioned before, the way arrays are counted. You don't start at 1, you start at 0. So 0, 1, 2, 3. Our next button then will be buttons dot uh, buttons square bracket random number. So we can do patterns pattern sorry dot push and then buttons and then in square brackets random number. And it makes the whole process a lot less um, bulky. We still need to play the button though, so let's do buttons dot uh, buttons random number dot play and see how that goes. Yellow, green, blue, blue, green, green. Yep, so that's working. And look at all the lines of code we've saved. We've got two lines of code doing what about 20 to 30 did before. And it's also Future proofed. If I want to come back to this and add in a purple button, for example, this is already coded to handle that. I don't have to add an extra if. Still not quite right because the pattern's generating forever. We only ever want to generate the pattern when we've reached the end of it. We only want to add one extra and then set it to be the player's turn. So we're going to have a few ifs in here that will check the length of the pattern, add an extra button if necessary, and then tell the player it's there, go again. So let's have a think then. We'll um, make use of this position again. So we'll say straight away, if open brackets position is less than pattern dot length, 
So if the position is less than the length of the pattern, that means there's a button left to play. So we need to play our way through the series before we add the last one. Let's uh, put a comment in there. Oops. If there are buttons left to play through, play them first, which is what that if is figuring out. Let's do a new line for that and then else here. So if there are no more buttons to play, we want to add a button to it. Don't need to trace anymore. The set timeout we will still use, um, but it won't be there. So we'll come back and cut it out in a second. So if there are any buttons to play through, we're going to play through them here, which should be fairly simple. We should just have to do pattern position dot play. And that will play current position in the pattern, and we also need to increase position. And just write it both ways: position equals position, position plus one. Just so you understand that that is the same as that, because that's the way we did it before. And that's where we need the set timeout. So we'll do drag that line up there, put it on the new line. And that will call the next move again in a second after playing the last one. Eventually we'll get to the point where the pattern's played everything it needs to, so this else will kick in. Because if the position isn't less than the length of the pattern, this will happen and we'll add a new button to the pattern. And we'll finally set it to be the player's turn. So we'll do player's turn equals true. And the player should be able to take over from there. And let's see if that works. So it should only generate one for, uh, for starters, and it has just done that. So it's now my turn. If I click that, it says it's right. I can't click anything else after that because um, we've still got stuff to handle. I've, I've, I've clicked everything I need to in that current version of the pattern, so what the game should be doing is, is going back to the computer's turn, which means we need to go back into our clicked function. We can now collapse the next move because the computer's pattern generation seems okay so far, let's collapse that, go to our player's turn and when they've reached the end of the pattern we have to swap back to being the computer's turn. And we can check that in here, when the player's right, so when, when we're right we increase the position and we'll have to check to see there if the position's reached the end of the pattern it needs to go back to the computer's turn. Check to see if it's the computer's so we'll say if position equals equals, remember we're doing two equals when we're checking something, one equals to set something, pattern dot length. So if the position has reached the end of the pattern, it's the computer's turn. So we use this set timeout again, which I think is still on my, no it's not, not on my clipboard, so we'll copy that. We're getting a little bit of crossover with this position variable now, so we need to be careful because we're, pos we're increasing it in a lot, of, a lot of places and never resetting it anyway. So let's also reset that before we go to the computer's turn. Let's do position equals zero, resets the position for the computer's turn. Let's do the player the same favour from our next move section. So when it's the player's turn, position should be reset to zero. Getting a little bit confusing there, I know I could have done that in a nicer way, sorry. I think I did in the prototype, but obviously the pressure of the audience is, is getting to me. Let's see if that works. Computer's turn, he's generated one. Let's copy it. Okay, we got that right. Computer's turn again. One, two. It seems to be working. Very good. And that's pretty much it for the uh, the computer's AI. We've um, got just about everything in there we need to do except for handling the game over. 
which we can worry about a little bit later. But for the sake of getting the, the pattern generated, we're done. We'll move on to the next section where I think we'll start to make it look nice. We'll get in a, a score and so on. But yeah, it's, it's progressing. Just take, take a bit of time to make sense of what we've just done, because that's probably the biggest section so far. Have a read through it again. Make sure it makes sense. Comment extra bits if you feel, feel the need. And we'll make it look nice in the next bit. Okay, so the game just about works, but it, it looks a bit stupid. We've got four buttons that are the same colour, and they don't make any sound, and they're just generally a bit boring. So we're going to work on that. We're going to edit one of them, which will actually affect all of them. And we'll do that in a way that we can really quickly change or duplicate the button and change the base colour. So we can have four buttons of different colours with different sounds very, very quickly. We'll start with the graphics, we'll eventually make the sound as well, but um, just for the sake of getting the graphics done, select one of them and you can right click and edit or just double click and you'll go into that red button. And we're going to change all of this now to look nicer. We still need the code that we've got, so what we can do is just rename this layer, we'll call this code, I know it's only got the word stop, but still, we need that. And instead of having the graphic on there, I'm going to cut that. And I'm going to remove the other frames, since we don't need them. And make a new layer to start the graphics on. Drag that below the code, just for the sake of keeping it in order. And this is going to be the base colour of our button. So make a layer called base colour, and let's paste the red back in, paste it in place. And I'm actually going to delete the outline. So I'm going to select that, press delete. When you're happy with the base colour, this one will be red um, for now. We'll duplicate it to make a blue and so on. But when you're happy with it, just lock that layer. We don't really need um, any access to that for the rest of the button. If you make a new layer, this one we'll call, um, let's call it the depth. It's not really adding depth to it, it's kind of simulating it. And to start with that one, we're again going to paste in place. So pasting the same red circle over itself. Again, going to delete the outline and then select the fill. And we're going to add a gradient to this to change the red or change the base color that's underneath it to make it look a bit more 3D. So we're going to come up to the color palette, make sure you've got the fill color selected, and we're going to change it from a solid color to a radial gradient. And by default, we get this black to white gradient, which isn't exactly what we need. It's not a million miles away though. We're going to start by changing both colours to black. So click on the one that isn't already black and you can change through your, your hue, saturation and brightness and so on. If you select the brightness, drag that right down to black. So we've got solid black at the moment. We're going to manipulate it a little bit to make it a bit more worthwhile. So with it still selected, Pick the colour that represents the very middle, find the alpha of that colour and drag it down to zero. And you can see on the three other versions of the button that we can now see the red coming through. The black's still a bit too dominant though. So I'm going to add another swatch to this gradient just by clicking somewhere. Drag this near the end so that the black itself only really comes in at the end, and even that's a bit too bright. So I'm actually going to drop the alpha of the solid black down to say 80, 75 possibly. So we at least get some of the base color coming through. And that's that's everything for now on that layer. We will come back to it because that's the layer we're going to animate to, to make the flash, make the, the white glow when we click our button. But for now, let's let's leave it. Lock it for the sake of keeping it as it is, and we'll add another layer on top, and we'll call this Shine. And here we're going to put a sort of Web 2.0 Shine on top. If you find your Oval tool again, which if you remember is hidden under your rectangle, and we're going to start this about a quarter of the way down, but halfway across. If you start, if you click and start dragging, and hold your Alt key so that the the bubble grows out from where you first clicked. Just get an oval that sort of fills the top half like that. And let go. Swap back to your selection tool, 
delete the outline, and we're going to apply a radial, um, sorry, not a radial, a linear gradient to this. So select it, go to your colour palette, and we're going to do a linear gradient. We don't need three colours on this, we just need the two, so we're going to um, drag that one off, change them both to white, so white at each end, and that's probably okay. If we deselect it, we can see that the colours are okay, but they're going the wrong way. And there are a few ways you can change that. You could select the fill and navigate your way to the gradient transform tool, which is hidden away under the free transform tool. That gives you the ability to rotate and scale your gradient, so you could line it up like so, which is what we're going for. Um, I find the easiest way is just to take the bucket fill tool and you can paint the gradient the way you want it to be. So we just want this to go from top to bottom, I think. And we get the same effect, but two different ways of doing it. Feel free to play around with that. I don't want to get hung up on it, um, just for the sake of getting the video finished. And as one last little effect, I think I'm going to add a blurry kind of specular highlight underneath the shine. So I'm going to add another layer underneath the, um, the shine. Let's call it Blurry Glow, just for the sake of learning a little bit extra. I'm going to zoom in for this one, so you can use Command Plus on your keyboard, or you can change your view there. You use the magnifying tool. I'm just going to take the oval tool, and this time just a solid white will do. So let's select solid white, and I'm going to draw a circle. Not that big. We don't need the outline, so I should have taken that off. And for some reason, I've got object drawing on, and I've just chosen the wrong oval tool. So let's swap back to the proper one don't need an outline so you can disable that, I'm just going to delete it after I've drawn it, so let's get rid of you. Position that somewhere near the top corner. And then you can either draw another circle or you can duplicate this one if you hold the Alt key. And I'm going to scale it down, so hold Shift, press Q to go to my quick transform, free transform there. Scale it down and I'm going to duplicate it again, put it up here somewhere. Just so I've got three kind of shiny points. Going to swap back to my selection tool and pick them all, or you could just click on the keyframe, which will select everything. And in order to blur them, we're going to apply a filter to them, so we need to convert them to a movie clip. So if you right click, you can convert to symbol, choose movie clip, let's call it blur or blurriness. No, just blurry will do. With that movie clip selected, we can now apply a filter. So go to the properties panel and find the filters section. We're just going to add a blur. The default settings aren't quite right, so I'm going to put the quality up and put the blur up a bit, maybe not too much, something like that. I still think that's a bit in your face, so I'm going to find this colour effect section of the properties tab as well. We'll change the style to alpha and we'll just lower that somewhere to maybe around the 70% mark. Play around with it until it, it looks um, good to you. It's also worth pointing out at this point that filters aren't the best in terms of performance. So there are workarounds, you could just make your, your graphics in Photoshop and bring in the image, or what Flash allows you to do, if you right click on a symbol, you can actually convert it to a bitmap. It's not a massive issue in this particular game because our, our buttons don't move, they don't scale, they don't rotate, so they're not really being redrawn. So we wouldn't really notice an, a change in performance here, but just so you understand how to do it, that's how we can convert that to a bitmap. So that has now been added to our library as an image. So we could replace that and they'd all update and so on. So that's how you do that. If we just zoom back out, we're getting to the finished state of our button. Feel free to play around with it. It's not perfect by any means. I think that's still a bit too bright, but oh well. I'm going to lock that layer and I'm just going to see what happens when we run it. I think we, we might get an error because they don't have a second frame to jump to. And we can't see them animate anyway, so no idea which button the right one is, I guess. Wrong. Okay, we'll work on the animation then. Various ways we could do this. We could just start adding in extra frames here for our depth layer, which would work just fine. The issue with that is if we wanted to change it later on, we'd have to change it for every button. If we convert that layer into its own symbol, 
we can then edit just that symbol and it will propagate across all buttons. So we'll, we'll start by doing that. If you unlock your depth layer and click to select everything on it, right click and we'll convert this to a symbol, but this time we're going to make it a graphic because we don't want it to to play on its own, we want it still to be bound to this timeline and that's what a graphic is, it's basically just an extension of this timeline rather than making a new timeline which is what a movie clip would do. So we're going to change it to a graphic and we'll call this um, depth anim and hit OK. In order for our graphics animation to actually play this symbol needs the amount of frames for it to loop through, otherwise it just wouldn't play. If, even if we had 100 frames of animation in our graphic, if we only have one frame here, they won't play because there is no timeline to play them through. Unlike a movie clip, which has its own timeline, which would just play through. So let's go to frame 10, and I'm going to select all my layers because they'll all need to exist. Well, everything except the code. And you can either hit F5 or you can just right click and insert a normal frame. So we have 10 frames of time on this timeline. Now with the depth layer selected, if we double click, we can go in there and we can animate this. Now the first frame is our default pose. We, um, we don't need to change that, that's how the buttons are going to look normally. What I'm going to do is go to frame 2, right click and insert a keyframe so that we get the first keyframe copied over in its, in its exact state. And we're going to change that gradient to have a white outline. So with it selected, let's go to our color palette and let's just change all the colours to a white tint. Drag them all up to the top and see how that looks. So that's very obviously different to the other three instances of it. At the moment it's only got the two frames so it wouldn't quite work. If we, we test that at the moment you can see it was a very weird effect there. You could tell we'd clicked on it but it was a bit... Hmm. <laughs> a bit wrong. So let's go back to our timeline and let's just go to frame 10 in our graphic here because that's how long our buttons timeline was and let's just insert a frame. Give that a go and you can see now it's very obvious which button was clicked. Let me go before my go I think then. I was just very quick. broke it there. We'll fix that later on. Not to worry, we're doing the graphics at the minute. Okay, um, it's all well and good at the moment but the prototype had some animation to it and to do that all I did was copy this first frame and put it at the end and then I animated back to it with a shape tween. So there are, there are various ways we could do it. We could right click, copy the frame, come to the end, right click, paste frame or you can simply hold the alt key and drag that keyframe to put it at the end, make a copy of it. When you've done that, if you right click in the middle and create a shape tween, we now get this gradual fade from the white back to the original black. If we try that in the game, you can see that it pulses almost. It's letting me click when it's not my go. It's not good. We will fix that. Right, so our graphic for the red button is done. I'll just quickly show you how easy it is now to, to make our other buttons. So I'm going to lock the depth layer. I'm going to skip out to scene one. And we're going to replace these buttons. Before we can do that, we actually need to make the button we're going to replace it with. So in my library, I'm going to right click on my red button. I'm going to duplicate it. And I'm going to call it blue button and hit OK. If we double click on that we can now edit this blue button, unlock the base colour layer, select it and just choose a blue. Dead simple. Well, <laughs> it's got alpha down. Drag the alpha up so we can actually see that layer we've done. <sighs> Do it when you've got it selected. There we go. We have a blue button. Really easy. Skip out to scene one and we can now click on the button we want to be the blue button, let's just make sure it is, so it's called blue and we can swap its instance, it's swap its symbol, you can also do it by right clicking and choose swap symbol. 
find our blue button and press OK. We can see that it keeps its instance name, but it now looks blue. And if we try that, all the animation has come across. Let's play it until we actually get blue selected. There we go. You can see that it stayed blue when it animated, and it's um, it's working. Quickly do the green. So that's the green one. Let's duplicate our blue. Call it green button. Edit it. Green. Back to scene one. Swap that symbol. And finally the yellow, so let's duplicate one of them again. Yellow button. Change our base colour to yellow. Hopefully it doesn't look too green. Mm, don't really like that. Let's go brighter. Mm, no, no good. Oh well, you can worry about that. As long as it works, you can you can make yours look yellower. Yeah. You can change the uh, the gradient if it's possibly because it's too black. So you can try editing your depth. Anyway, let's swap our final one. Swap that to yellow. And there we have it. We've got four buttons. So green, green, green. Green, green, blue. I'm not telling it that it's not the player's turn. I guess we didn't do that in the coding section. We will fix that, sorry. And just really quickly to align these, let's make sure our snapping's on. We're going to drag the blue button away and then bring it back and then use these guidelines that appear to snap it to the top of the red and the left of the green. Do something similar with the green, so let's bring it back in so it snaps to the blue and the yellow, and then do the same there. If you don't quite like the spacing, I think they're further apart horizontally than they are vertically. Phone's buzzing at me. Um, let's just nudge those two down. And then to center the whole thing, let's select them all, quickly group them, which you can do with. Command G or Control G. Find our Transform or Align tab. Click Align Central in both directions, and then let's ungroup them by breaking them breaking them apart. So break apart, and they should be nice and centered. I didn't really like my depth animation, and this is where the benefit of making it a separate graphic comes in. So if I edit just the depth graphic. I think the, the white isn't quite obvious enough, so I'm going to go to the second frame and I'm going to edit that. And because this is a graphic that's in all four buttons, it will make the changes across all four buttons. Um, possibly needs to be a bit brighter there. And let's maybe have it black at the edge, just as it was. So, still got the black outline, but it's very obviously white inside. Let's give that a go. It's a bit more like it. Tinker with it till um, it's how you want it to look. But I'm going to move on to the sound. So the graphics are working. Let's make some sounds. And to do that, we're going to use a free website, which is very good. Lots of people use it, from what I can tell, called bfxr.net. And this lets you export sounds. Hopefully, you can hear them. You can just randomize them, you can choose from presets. I'm going to use the blip select option and just tweak it a little bit. So let's make a blip select and maybe hmm, make it a bit longer. It's a bit, uh, a bit painful to hear that one, so let's change the wave type. It's a bit more like it. Yeah, I like that one. And the frequency, it's maybe a bit. Hi, so let's drag that down. Okay, so that can be one. When you're happy with the sound, you can export it. So let's export lav. 
let's save it next to our game. So we'll call this blip1. Then either make a new sound or I'm just going to edit this one actually, just put the frequency up a little bit. Let's maybe go up in threes. Go again a little bit higher. Export that one. Let's call it blip2. Go up three again. And call that blip three. You get the idea. And three more. And there we have our sounds. How easy was that? Back to Flash, we need to import these to our library, which I'm pretty sure you can do just by selecting them and dragging them in. At least I hope you can. Watch it crash. There we go. So we've got four sounds in our library that we can quickly play through. Very good. Now let's apply them to the button. I'm just going to quickly double click on each one and I'm actually going to use my code layer so it should really be code and sound. Go to the second keyframe, this is where we want the sound to start because that means this, this button's been selected. I'm going to hit F6 with that keyframe selected go to the properties and we can choose the sound that we want to play. So let's have blip one for red. Go to the blue button, do the same thing but choose blip two. Go to the green same process, blip 3, and finally the yellow, blip 4. And let's see how that works. And you get the idea. So, when we get around to fixing a few bugs and putting a game over and so on, we've we've got a game there, but it's progressing quite well. If you're new to Flash and you've got this far, hopefully you feel like you've learnt something and it's not just copying me without a clue about what you're doing. We will leave this section there and we'll we'll polish the game up in the last section. Okay, this video is kind of overrunning. It's a little bit longer than I had anticipated, but not to worry. We'll, we'll try and bring it to a close now. We're going to start by fixing the bug that I pointed out in the last section. So let's jump straight to the code. On your main timeline, go to the actions. And the reason we can click while the, the computer's generating the pattern is because we never set our player's turn variable when the player's finished with their go. So when it's the computer's turn, we also need to say player's turn equals false. And if we give that a go, let it generate a bit of a pattern. Okay, and if I, after I've had my go here, I'll start clicking like crazy. And I can't, you see now, I don't get those messages. There we go, that's fixed that issue. The second thing is that it's it's not getting any quicker when the pattern gets bigger, which is one of the things with this game. It gets harder, it gets quicker, doesn't give you as much time to memorize it. So um, we'll, we'll look at putting that in. And it also raises an issue with how we've got go to and play here, and we just used play down here. We'll, we'll see that issue come into play in a second. But to make it get quicker, in the prototype at least, I just changed this second. So this is one second, one move every second. I just reduced it based on the length of the pattern. So you could divide that by a certain amount based on the pattern. Um, you could even just use pattern.length as a very obvious example. This, this isn't balanced, so we will change this. But if we use the length of the pattern, it will dramatically speed up. The, the move generation. So let's give that a go. So you can see that's beating very quickly. And you can see there we skipped 
a playthrough of the button because because the pattern was getting so so fast. There's actually three yellows there, but it only showed two, I think. So I click once, twice. There should be one more, which didn't play because it's going so fast. And you saw it again there. So one, two, three, four, five. Watch it. I only played once that time, so it's getting so quick that this this play command doesn't have time to reach the end of the button's timeline before it's being called on again, which is why we should use we should deliberately tell it to go to frame two and play. You could also um, put in some kind of safeguard against the time getting so quick. So you can have this as a variable instead, just above, and check that it's not gone so low that the button doesn't have time to play. But if we try it with the go to and play method, hopefully we get the same button a couple of times in a row. And there, that seemed to go very quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's um, the blue button skipped there. So between the first, the first, the first and the third moves, the blue kind of messed up a bit, and that's because that pattern dot length isn't a very good marker to uh, to use on its own. We can use it to a degree, but we're going to use it slightly differently. So we're going to start by putting it in brackets. And just before it, we're going to do one plus, and then we'll do pattern dot length, and we'll divide it by a suitable suitable amount. So maybe every time the pattern gets one bigger, we want to increase the speed by five percent. So we could divide that by twenty. So uh, twenty-five to make a hundred. That will increase the speed by five percent every time. If we just ramp that up a bit to ten percent, just for the sake of seeing it in effect, let's give that a go. We should slowly get quicker. It's getting slightly quicker. Probably not a bad amount, that 10%, so I might leave that in. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that. You can play around with that. If you feel it's getting too difficult, then tweak the numbers. That's, um, that's totally up to you. Let's add a score. So what you might be tempted to do is just use the length of the pattern as the score. So if they complete the first pattern, they get point. If they complete the second, they've got two points and so on. Um, what I'm actually going to do is give them a point every time they get a correct button. So the bigger the pattern, the more points you get for that pattern. So I'm going to make a new variable up at the top. Let's call it score. And we'll set it to zero to begin with. And every time we click a correct target, instead of tracing right, we'll actually out we'll increase the score and then we'll output the score. So before we trace anything, Let's do score equals score plus one. We could also do score plus plus. And then we'll trace the score. So let's just trace the word, the variable score, and see how that goes. So got one point there. Second wave's worth two points, so we should go up to three, and we do, and so on. And that way there's a bit of a distinction between people who, say you get to the 8th wave and you remember 7 of them, you'll get a better score than someone who gets to the 8th wave and totally loses the bearings and forgets it all. So there's a bit of leeway to give points within waves that way. Okay, let's look at getting that score output on screen. I'm going to go to the timeline and we can do it on a separate layer, it doesn't necessarily matter, let's maybe divvy it up. So I'm going to call that first layer buttons. Let's add another one on top. Maybe call it hood so we could later on decorate it. We probably won't have time but I'm sure you'll be able to figure that out based on what we've drawn already. 
I'm going to start by adding a font to the flash file. This keeps things consistent. It also means the font will be embedded into the SWF. So if you're using a font that people don't have, it will it will be built into the game. So let's right click in the library, do new font. Choose a font you, you want. I'm going to give it a name as well. Let's call it game font. Change the family to one that makes sense. I don't know, let's pick a random one. Wingdings probably isn't the best idea. Let's go with the kind of pixely one. It's S something. No. I don't know. Super Justice sounds good though. That might even be the one I used in the prototype. And in the um, this box you choose the characters you want to embed. And I just want the uppercase, lowercase, numerals and punctuation. I'm not bothered about Japanese and Chinese glyphs. So just choose those and hit OK. So we can now use that font and we can be pretty sure that it's going to be in the SWF. So if we draw a text field, take the text tool, we'll put this up at the top. Just draw one maybe the width of the screen. And before you click away, go to the properties, change it from static text. We don't want static text, we need dynamic text so we, we can update it with our code. And we give it an instance name so that we can get to it. So if I call this score box, change the font to match our game font, which will be up at the top. Choose our game font. Choose a color that makes sense. Let's go with white. You might want to change the size and the spacing and so on. I'll leave that down to you. If we put that in, deselect it, make sure it stays so it's it's definitely there and it's called score box. Let's go back to the code. And every time we guess correctly, we'll update it. So here when we've we've got the score, instead of tracing it out now, we'll do score box. Oops. Scorebox.txt to access the text property of that text field equals, and we'll just do, um, we can't just type score, I don't think it likes that because that's a number, but never know, let's see, oh, it does like that, I think it's because I've never specified that score is just a number, but what you should do really is have some sort of, con either convert it to a string, or have a string that goes before it, so let's put in quotes there, we'll put score, colon space, then close the quotes and put plus score. So we now get the following. Actually see the word score. And so on. It's starting to sound a bit like Zelda there with his ocarina. Or Link with his ocarina. Uh, what else can we do? We need a game over. We've still just got a trace that says wrong, haven't we? So we can work on that. Just before we do, let's let's maybe add a background in. I did say we'd do that, so I'm going to add a new layer for the background, put it right at the bottom. I'm going to make use of a couple of things we've learned. So what I want is a sort of stripy diagonal background. You could painstakingly go through it and draw like loads of lines and I don't know, something like that and eventually go back and colour it all in if you wanted to. I'm going to cheat a little bit by using our bitmap conversion from before to fill an area with a with a bitmap. And to make the bitmap I'm just going to take the rectangle tool. We don't need a fill for this one, so no fill, and just draw a box. So hold shift to make sure it is a, a solid box. Swap to the line tool, connect the corners, like so. Then I'm going to select all of it, select that whole box, and I'm going to hold Alt and click somewhere near the top left and drag it along itself so it snaps back to itself. And we're left with this kind of shape. What I want to do is just delete a few of the lines so we're left with four stripes, or two stripes and two corner pieces. I'm then going to fill these in, so I do need a colour now. Let's go with white and take the bucket fill and just fill alternate lines with different colours. This might look a bit, yeah, that, that's possibly a bit too dark but we can fix that later. When you're happy with it, double click on the lines to select them and get rid of them. 
I'm going to select what we're left with. I think it's maybe a bit big, so I'm going to scale it down. Right click, convert to bitmap. So I've made a bitmap object there that I can use to paint a bigger area. So I'm going to delete it. I'm going to draw, take my rectangle tool and draw just a little bit larger than the actual screen. You could draw it exact to the screen if you like. Select the fill. Go to your color palette and I'm going to choose a bitmap fill and it will give you the option of the bitmaps that you've got in your library. We don't want to use our specular thing. You could do something along those lines if you like. I'm just going to click that new one we made. I'm going to get rid of the outline by double clicking on it and getting rid of it. I'm going to convert the resulting rectangle or square to a symbol so we can do some color effects to it. Convert it to a symbol, let's call it background. Make sure it's a movie clip so that we can put filters and so on onto it. For starters I'm actually going to tint it. So before we did alpha I'm going to change the color effect to tint and you can choose a color to tint that background with so feel free to, to play around with it. What, what did we have in the demo? Some very pale kind of almost blue-gray wasn't it? Maybe something like that. You can change the, the amount of tint. If you go the whole way then the stripes disappear play around with it, I don't have the time now to uh, keep fiddling. I'm also going to add a shadow or a glow, but I'm going to make this an inner glow so it goes inwards. I'm going to change the colour to black, put the blur up so it comes in a lot further, put the quality up and just play around with it a bit till it just sort of frames the screen. Feel free to, to play around, draw over it, draw swirly bits around it just for the sake of giving it some extra content. You might want to draw a hood box, so you'll go back to your hood layer, maybe draw a box underneath your text. You could do it to represent or correspond with the colour of your background. You could even add filters to your text, which is what I did in the prototype. I added a, a glow um, that was very small but very strong, so maybe a two pixel glow that had a thousand percent strength and it acted as an outline. So if I change that to black, when we get a score we can now have an outline for our text and then maybe, I don't know, a drop shadow. Don't go overboard with the, the filters because they do have a bit of an effect on performance. But, uh, let's put that up. Maybe drop the strength a bit, see how that looks. So it should have a shadow and an outline on our score. There we go. Makes it a bit punchier. Play around with it. Um, make it look how you want it to look. But let's let's finish this up so we can actually lose, which we can't do just yet. We're going to need another text field. So this is where having the font in one place comes in. Because if we want to change the text, the font of the game at any point, we just change that one part of it and we're, we're okay. Make sure you're working on the HUD layer, possibly lock the others and draw your text field in. Let's make it a suitable size. Give it an instance name, so let's call this output. I'm going to center this, so in the format I'm going to center it. I'm happy with the rest, but what I want to do is take filters that I've applied to the score text, so I'm going to select that text field. I'm going to copy all of the existing filters there, go back to this text field and I'm going to paste them back. Paste them in so that we've now got the same effect on the bottom here. I'm going to use this output to um, give the player some instructions and tell them when they've lost. So at the start we want to uh, remind them, we can just set the text straight away up here. When we start generating the pattern let's also set the text at the bottom. We can do output.text equals watch the sequence. And let's see if that works. Yeah, so it's reminding us to watch the sequence. And then when the sequence is complete, we can change that, make it play it back. So let's copy that line. When it swaps to be the player's turn, we'll um, change the output text to say repeat the sequence. Repeat the sequence, yeah. repeat the 
pattern, repeat the sequence, either or. Try that. Next, there go. And maybe when they get it right, we'll give them a message as well. So um, every time the player gets something right up here, when, when we award them a point, let's change the output text to say, yeah. We also need it to go back to, say, watch the sequence when the computer's having its go. So let's, uh, we've still got that copied. When it swaps back to the computer's turn, we're getting a bit messy with our text all over the place now. Um, try to be a bit neater with it. That should do the job. We might not get a yeah for the first click. Okay, not too bad. Um, and let's put in some text for when we lose. So let's at least say game over, even though we haven't stopped the thing going yet. So paste that in and put, I don't know. Oh no. Oh no's. So if we get it wrong, yeah, we get oh no's. Might also be worth just having the score appear to begin with. So uh, let's copy that. Let's paste that as well, put the top. Okay, very messy, but it's um, a work in progress for you. If, as long as you've understood it, I did mention it's not the most efficient way to code. We're on the timeline to begin with anyway, so um, let's get it working and worry about making it neat later. The player will never know, as long as the game's fun. What have we got left to do? When we have a game over, we will need to reset. Various ways you can do that. We could just jump to a different frame and then have a button that brings us back. I think what I did in the original was just to um, stop the game briefly and show the game over message. So we could just do that. Yeah, when it's when it's game over, we'll qu quickly set player's turn to false, so they can't have another go. And let's just comment this. Let's play the button that they should have clicked instead of the one they did click, and we'll grey out or black out the button that they did click. So start by playing the one they should have clicked, which is actually that pattern position. So we'll do that dot go to and play two. So that's playing play the button they should have clicked. And we'll grey out the button they did click. Now this is something we haven't done. We're just going to do a colour transform, which is kind of like tinting um, that we did in the properties tab. So we'll take the one they did click, which is click info dot target dot transform dot colour transform, which is prompting me there equals, and we're going to make that a new colour transform, and in brackets we just want to multiply the red, the green and the blue by a, a low number, so that will we'll dull it down. So let's maybe half the RGB values, so 0 0.5, 0 0.5 and 0.5. I know that's um, quite a big change considering we've not used colour transforms before, but let's um, see what that does. So I should click blue, if I click yellow, it plays the blue and yellow gets greyed out. Okay. I'm going to change our nose to say game over. And we then want to restart the game after a few seconds, don't we? So. Let's start a timer, just as we've done a set timeout that will restart the game really quickly. So reset the game after a few seconds. So we'll do set timeout. We'll call this function restart game and we'll do it after three seconds. So 3000 milliseconds. 
just for the sake of tidying this up, let's collapse this. Whoops. Collapse it down so we've got a bit of room. And then let's make that reset game function. Function, was it reset or restart? See, I should have memorized it before I collapsed it. Uh, restart game. Restart game. Nothing in the brackets. And then open the curly brackets. So reset everything and start again. Which is basically everything we do up here. So we could pretty much copy and paste and then just edit it slightly to, um, to stop it conflicting with itself. So basically what we're doing is all of this. We won't need to put the buttons back in. The buttons aren't changing. But we do need to reset the pattern, the position and so on. So let's copy it and we'll filter out what we don't need. Let's just tab it all in. We don't need to reset the buttons, as I mentioned, because they're fine. We don't need the words var in front of anything anymore, so we can get rid of them. They're already made, we just want to affect them. Then we do want to start generating the pattern just as we did, and we'll reset the text as well. So that should be everything we need to restart the game, with the exception of the, uh, the greyed out button, which we'll fix as well. But let's just see if that works. Let's just get it wrong. Okay, so that does work, except we need to fix the button that's greyed out. We don't actually have a reference to the last button that was clicked anymore, so we're pretty much going to have to go through all of them and reset it. So we'll um, have a, a little loop that goes through them. I know we haven't done a loop yet, but if this makes sense to you, then you've got that extra little bit of learning going on as well. I do explain these in my other videos if you want to look them up. So let's loop through the buttons to reset their color transforms. I'm going to use a for loop which I can't dwell on, I'm just going to type it out. Basically make a variable that counts through a certain number of things, in this case our list. So we want to count through all the buttons and our counter is going to get one bigger every time. And we just want to do buttons i, so we're accessing that index of our buttons list, dot transform, dot color transform. And we just want a default color transform. So that's a new color transform with nothing in the brackets. So it's a default. Now, if we get it wrong, after three seconds, it resets and we're off again. Star Wars. <laughs> oh, not anymore. And uh, yeah, there's a, a super simple game for you. Um, I did want to cram in a bit more, but I, I know this video is getting very long now. So I will include an updated version in the downloads. I'll also include a version that's done in classes for those of you who want to, I don't think there'll be many classes, might just be one or two, uh, but just for the sake of seeing it laid out in external files. Hope you've learned something. Do develop it, mix it up a bit, make the buttons move around, have more buttons, um, do funky stuff with it, and let me see what you've come up with. Goodbye for now. <laughs>